Welcome to the Liberty Entrepreneurs Podcast, where we explore how to build freedom through the entrepreneurial process. Our goal is to provide you with the tools and mindset needed to create your lifestyle of independence and flexibility. I'm your host, Ash Whitener, and this is episode 35, How Bitcoin Enhances Gold, with our guest, Josh Shigala, co-founder and CEO of Voltoro.com. Josh didn't start out in finance, gold, or even Bitcoin, but instead he found a niche creating 3D animations at the dawn of their existence. Basically, when Toy Story 1 was coming out, Josh was working on his own short films. Like most entrepreneurs, this was just a stepping stone on his journey. Josh later founded a website which allowed women to find and trade clothing, but this too was a bit before its time. He was building the sharing economy long before it became popularized with Uber and Airbnb. His journey finally led him to creating Vault Toro, a gold vaulting service which supports gold to Bitcoin transactions and includes an open marketplace for each user to place bid ask prices in order to buy, sell, and manage their portfolio. This offers both gold bugs and Bitcoiners alike an easy way to preserve their wealth in gold, but easily spend in Bitcoin, a match truly made in heaven. Last but not least, if you'd like to receive all of Liberty Entrepreneur's podcasts delivered directly to your email, head on over to our website and subscribe to our weekly newsletter. Please follow us on Twitter at Liberty E Podcast and Facebook slash Liberty Entrepreneurs. Show notes are found on our website, libertyentrepreneurs.com, and I hope you enjoy the show. So I'm happy to welcome on the show today Josh Shigala, co founder and CEO of Vault Toro, which is a Bitcoin and gold marketplace and vault. Uh, Josh, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Ashley. Yeah, it's great to be on the show. It's, I love it. I love the show. It's a great idea and it's a, it's an important topic. Thanks, man. Yeah, you just interviewed me last week on the Tatiana Moros show, which I think Tatiana wasn't on for the first time, but you <laughs> really stepped in there and did a great job, so I appreciate it. And yeah, thanks again for coming on Liberty Entrepreneurs. We're excited to have you on here. We're always excited to speak with people who are challenging the government, not through force, but through ideas and challenging them through offering goods and services that compete directly against what they're offering. For you, that is real money, Bitcoin and gold. You help people store and preserve their wealth and value in private money or free market money, as opposed to fiat money or paper money, which is politically based. Before we get into the whole gold and Bitcoin thing, Josh, fill in the gaps on who you are, where you currently are, what you're interested in, and then let's gradually find out how you became an entrepreneur. You know, I was born in Berlin and my mother took me to Australia when I was like six and went through the normal school stuff. But uh, my mother, my all my family are all musicians and artists, so they they were always entrepreneurial because that's how you have to be as uh, if if you're a musician you have to go out there and find gigs and do gigs and stuff like that so my parents uh, really never had a a, a job such uh, but always had work you know always went out and found money and i always saw the struggle of of uh, my parents and music so i i tended more towards uh technology and um and uh, actually at the time doing graphics, graphic art. So I, I found a silicon graphics machine that I could work on and teach myself with back in the day and uh, made Australia's first 3D animated short film. And, and what year was this? That was back in uh, 96, 97, something like that. Just to help timestamp this for our listeners, what other type of animation was coming out at that time? Oh well, the f actually, Toy Story one just came out, so it was and that was and that was, was huge, like, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. That was the first three D animated, fully three D animated film, and uh, it was you know it's uh, it was an amazing feat for the for the computation that was around for the day. It was uh, it was amazing and definitely inspired me back then. And uh, then moved up to Sydney by myself and 
But I've always had these little side projects. So I got jobs, amazing post-production facilities and always had these little side projects happening uh, that were sometimes businesses and sometimes just uh, projects. And uh, one of them was a swap, uh, the world's first swap site for women's clothing because I noticed that uh, a lot of people were just, there was so much waste in that whole clothing industry. And I was, I, I've always had a fascination with alternative economies. And that's why I'm in gold and Bitcoin <laughs> uh, nowadays. But uh, seeing how we can deal with trade without money. And it really was a big lesson in how, how money, what money is and how it plays a part. And uh, because swapping is fantastic, you know, it's a really cool way of going about trade, but it's very cumbersome. So, you know, I might like a, a, a pair of jeans that you've got, but you don't like any T-shirts that I've got. And so, but you like T-shirts that someone else has. And so, you know, and whereas a token really makes that work. Yeah. Yeah. I think they call that the double coincidence of wants, don't they? Right. It, yeah. Yeah. It's like, what's the coincidence of you having what I want and I having what you want and us finding each other and then still wanting that stuff and then making that exchange? That That's why money is so beautiful and important is that, you know, it's it's the most common commodity that people are willing to accept for goods and services. But you created a, a sh basically a sharing site where women... Uh, could come on and list their clothes or they could browse and see if there's something they wanted. Would they have to swap? Would they be able to purchase? Was it a marketplace as well? Or was it only, you know, hey, you ship me this, I'll ship you that. Yeah, thing. it was a marketplace as well um, kind of thing. They, so you basically went up and you uploaded as many items as you could and then you searched through other people's stuff and you put things in like a search request and that would then get sent off to them saying, hey, this person likes this. Um, have a look at their items. Is there anything you like? And you can quickly click no or yes, that, that, but I'll give you, you know, this and that if you give me that. And, and it's the sort of negotiation engine that we built. We did run that for, I think it was nine, no, eight years. It was the, it was way before all the sharing of economy of Airbnb and Uber and, and so all the crap now, but back then people would look at me like, uh, what? No one would want that. And I was thinking, God, oh, you go to the op shop, don't you? You know, you, you buy other people's old stuff and so yeah exactly i mean you, you were in the sharing economy before the sharing economy was cool was a thing yeah 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 it was even a thing for the most part that, that's really interesting that it was just women's clothing as well as opposed to just all clothing did you find the the demand or the market for women's clothing was just that that much larger well it was and you know this is a this is an actual this is a good tip for all entrepreneurs out there is that uh, we started as an actual swap everything site and no one was talking about us. You know, it wasn't really interesting. Then we decided, let's just cut it back to women's clothing only. And all of a sudden, we had every woman's magazine contacting us. We had massive amounts of press, free press, because all of a sudden, you're in a niche that they can cling on to and they want content. And when it was everything, it was like, uh, yeah, I guess it's interesting. They didn't really know how to cover us. So that's, I think, a really, it was a big lesson. Yeah, John Lee Dumas, who has made one of the most popular podcasts out there, Entrepreneur on Fire, he has a saying, the riches are in the niches. Basically, if you can niche down far enough where people really understand what you're doing and you give one niche product or service and you do it really well, then that's how you gain a big following. You know, for Liberty Entrepreneurs, our niche is helping people get in a mindset where they can provide freedom in their own personal lives through the entrepreneurial process. Yeah. It's not, hey, we're going to help you get freedom and we've got a 101 ways for you to get freedom, right? Mm -hmm. No, ours is very specific. I think that the best way for you to get freedom in your life is through the very niche, small thing of the entrepreneurial process. So it makes a lot of sense that now people are able to see you and the, the women's clothing swap site and really latch on to it, understand quickly what it is. And if that appeals to like maybe some fashion magazine, I, I won't dare try to name. <laughs> I have no clue. Our last guest, Marie McGrath out of Panama, the fashionista from Panama. She might be very interested. Marie, if you're listening to this show, I think you should contact Josh and see, uh, see what you can learn there. But 
Yeah, the riches are in the niches. And we've definitely got a niche now with Voltura. I mean, it's it's a Bitcoin gold, so it's within Bitcoin and it's the gold niche of Bitcoin. <laughs> you're the bridge between those two. Bring us up to speed on what you're doing now. What is Voltoro? How did you get the idea for it? And like, who are your ideal clients? Yeah, so, you know, I, I always feel when, when life gives you lemons, make really good tasting lemonade and sell it to thirsty people. And that's really what happened when Mt. Gox collapsed for me. I fell into a, you know, I, I lost a fair chunk of cash on that. Uh, Mt. Gox was a huge uh, Bitcoin exchange that um, that was uh, almost running a Ponzi scheme uh, that no one knew because they were very, very opaque. They, they didn't have any transparency. And it crashed and many people lost a lot of money. I think it was half a billion dollars at the time. That was a lot of money. Um, and so I, I was angry not and, and, and sad, not only for my own losses, but the fact that Bitcoin, which was so beautiful at disrupting banking, which was such a positive change to the world, was being now looked at like this big scam even more than it was before. And the press was saying, the CEO of Bitcoin, and, you know, run away with everyone's money. And it was all bull. You know, it was there is no CEO of Bitcoin. It's, it, it's just that press didn't understand it. Anyway... That sadness I channeled to say, right, I'm going to build a decentralized exchange because uh, I've had enough of it. Uh, I'm quite technical and, and my brother is a, an amazing technical guy as well. So we sat down together and, and uh, a decentralized exchange wasn't quite possible because we wanted it really fast. We wanted a, a price discovery mechanism. So we thought, well, let's focus on a centralized exchange that was ridiculously fast at trading, but using a uh, focus on transparency and using the blockchain and Bitcoin to prove reserves. So if anyone knows gold, uh, the big problem with a lot of banks as well, general fiat banks, is that they're totally intransparent. So we wanted to build an exchange where we could have 100 proof, 100 percent proof of above reserve uh, holdings. And that's what the blockchain allowed us to do. And that really inspired us. You're using that with gold. You're yeah. like putting the serial numbers or something in the blockchain for the gold that you that that I own that you've. So we're not quite doing that, but we drew inspiration from the blockchain. So what we do, uh, and we we are looking at doing something similar, which I'll go to in in a minute. But what we do is we give everybody an anonymous ID. Um, so that's kind of like a Bitcoin address. It's an anonymous number. You know, only the person that has the has the uh, account knows their own anonymous ID and can choose to share it if they need to prove they've got money or something like that. But uh, it's kept private. And when they log out of the system, we publish every anonymous ID plus the gold holdings and the Bitcoin holdings. And so when they log out, they can check if their gold holdings are correct. And we don't know when people are checking. So if we fiddle with the numbers, someone could bust us very quickly. What they do is they check, okay, I've, the right amount is for my anonymous ID and then they could because they can see everybody's they can see the sum of all holdings and then they see the uh, the vaulting facility statements that come out every week of how much gold is in the vault and they also have the BDO international auditing certificate so that's you know the third largest auditor in the world it's a multi-billion multi-billion dollar auditor and then also the insurance certificates so they can see exactly how much gold all of our users hold and how much gold is in the vault. And then the Bitcoin side, that's where you can check it on the blockchain right. and say, oh yeah, well, they're cold wallets because we show our cold wallets so they can see the addresses and okay, it all matches up. And, and you know, if, if Mt. Gox had that, red flags would have come up ages ago. Uh, and a lot of people would have saved a lot of money and a lot of heartache because they would have withdrawn that, those funds. And um yeah, it's sad that they didn't. But, uh, you know, that's the thing with uh, with capitalism and uh, you have major problems and other people come along and solve them. That's right. That's exactly right. That's that is capitalism. That is entrepreneurship is what what pains, what struggles do I see in society? What demand do I sense and how can I build a product or a service to satisfy that demand or to you know relieve that pain for my customers? Exactly. And, uh, you know, 
math is always preferred over regulations um, in the Bitcoin space. It's quite a, kind of a, a mantra from uh, the Bitcoin heads. Uh, I mean, I, I found Bitcoin because I was in the sharing economy very early and I always had a fascination with the economics. I found Bitcoin really early on when they were like $1 and that, that, that mantra really stuck by me. And to, to build you know, instead of going, oh, we don't like these bad actors doing this thing in whatever niche you're in, we need more regulations to, to stop them. Uh, in, in Bitcoin, we say, no, no, we, we need to build systems where mass doesn't allow the bad actors to act badly or doesn't incentivize right. bad actors. Right. It actually de-incentivizes bad actors because of all of the resources that they would need to use just to try to plan an attack that will most likely be unsuccessful. But it, it makes a lot more sense to work within the, the rules or the, the mathematical regulations, not political regulations, but the mathematical regulations of Bitcoin and use it as a tool of commerce instead of trying to, uh, to attack it. For Absolutely. And, and this is where you flip over from uh, rulers to rules. Right. And and this is a, a key difference that a lot of people don't understand about the concept of anarchy, of, of anything in anarchy, is, is that uh, they think, oh, there's no rules. Uh, that's not true. Anarchy is, everyone needs rules. We need rules in society. It's just how it is. But the concept of a ruler and giving massive amounts of power to them is a dangerous concept. And that's as much as we can pull away from that uh, to define rules in in a mathematical process and then say look if you don't like these rules then um, find another pro or another thing that maybe fits you better or yeah or create your own uh, yeah even better or create your own if you don't like the mathematical rules associated with like bitcoin or the blockchain we won't get too detailed into this but if you don't want to play by those rules nobody's forcing you to play by those rules go create Bob coin or Sally coin or Fred coin and, you know, write your own code and write your own rules and see how many people will voluntarily start using yours. It's a, it's, it's a really great system that we can now through mathematics have objective rules instead of having subjective rulers who, uh, you know, maybe a judge is having a bad day and sentences one marijuana smoker to 10 years in prison, but lets the other guy off with 30 days or something. Now, no, 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 it's not your subjectivity. It's mathematically based objective rules of a system where you, you're more than welcome to come in and use the system, but these are unbendable rules because they're backed by, you know, logic and math. Yeah, that's right. And you can see that, um, for instance, Freicoin was a coin based on what's called in financial uh, terminology, demurrage, which means that money slowly uh, loses value through a charge. It's a, it's a strange concept, but basically what he tried to do was say, uh, well, I'm not really into Bitcoin. I want a coin where when you hold it, it loses value. It adds value back to the network the longer you hold it and it promotes people spending. You know, this coin that did a big pump everyone jumped in and then everyone realized it's crap. No one wants to hold a coin that's losing value. It's really interesting because Augur is doing the same thing, the Ethereum-based Augur, yeah. uh, the prediction market. It loses value if you don't use it. So I'm, I'm really interested to see if people start dumping that. Right, well. right. Interesting. So, you know, and, and what I find beautiful about cryptocurrencies is that you can get a group of people together and try an economic theory out without any violence. Before we basically had Marxism or communism or socialism and all these isms that would end up with gulags and horrific bread lines and starvation and violence to back some of these philosophies up. But with uh, with some with some cryptocurrency with cryptocurrencies you you can try a coin that does some economical function without any violence attached. And if it fails, it fails. If the free market says, you know what, no, I'm, I don't like Firecoin, I, I like Bitcoin because it's capped and it's uh, whatever you like about it. So it's a very fascinating time to be alive because we can see economic theory in action right on and off the radar and be tried yeah and that's uh, uh, it's fantastic it's a real fertile test bed right now for economic theories and just money and the different types of money it's 
really, really special times right now that we have the freedom finally to create our own monies where we don't have to go through the, the regulation or the production costs to mint the monies. We can just, you know, you and I right now could create a new cryptocurrency in just a couple minutes and maybe people use it, maybe they don't, but there's an opportunity there. Let's back it up a little bit, Josh, and go back to the gold and Bitcoin because this is something that is near and dear to my heart. I've, I've been a gold bug for a while. Before Bitcoin was ever invented, I was buying gold and silver and precious metals as an alternative form of currency to try to protect myself against the inflation or the devaluation of the political money, uh, the U.S. dollar, the euro, etc. Yeah. But a lot of gold people, you know, the, they call themselves gold bugs. A lot of gold bugs don't yet appreciate Bitcoin. Whereas I see Bitcoin people, they don't talk about gold a lot, but they, for the most part, have a lot of appreciation for gold. Why do you think gold bugs or precious metal or hard money people in general are having a much more difficult time understanding and accepting Bitcoin as a new currency and, and money? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's only gold bugs. I think it's a lot of people don't understand Bitcoin um, because it's it's very it's a very technical thing and you have to be a little bit technical to, to even understand that the fact that it can't be hacked and you know, a lot of people say oh, it's a computer thing it can be hacked but bitcoin as a protocol can't be hacked it's like saying you can't hack two plus two to equal five it's it's a math it's a base math protocol <laughs> and uh and so you can't it doesn't matter what you do two plus two is always four and so that can't be hacked but really what you've also got is is that gold bugs especially have spent a lot of energy and a lot of time um, saying that fiat currency is bad, it's backed by nothing, it's made out of, it's printed out of thin air, it's value created out of thin air, and gold is found into existence um, and spent into existence, whereas fiat's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's lent into existence and all this other thing. So when when um when bitcoin came along it was again found it, it was it was this thing that was cut, produced out of thin air and it was just these numbers and i think a lot of them were a bit older so they're a little less trustworthy you know young people tend to um they they can risk a lot more young people because they got time to re-earn whatever they lose through their risks um so Young people tend to take up new technologies, especially when it comes to finance. Most people are very wary. Uh, what we're trying to do with Voltoro is bring those gold bugs that are now finally interested because they've heard more and more and they've, about Bitcoin. They're interested in it, but not they don't have enough interest to actually put some money on the line and buy some. So what we want to do is uh, allow people to, um, and this will be coming out in the next couple of months, purchase gold through Voltoro with fiat and then be able to spend that gold as Bitcoin. So if anything accepts Bitcoin, they can uh, they can use that Bitcoin address and pay that Bitcoin address with their gold. So what will happen is the gold gets sold on the Voltoro exchange uh, in the marketplace for a fair market price and then that value gets sent to a Bitcoin address um, mm. and then they get their doodad delivered to their home or the service or whatever they've bought. Yeah, so basically you're using the convenience of gold, which there's a large marketplace for gold, much much larger than the marketplace for Bitcoin, as an entry point for gold holders to sell their gold and basically exchange it into Bitcoin. And so now they have an easy way to have Bitcoin in their you know, private money portfolio. Yeah, and uh, you know, even if you don't understand Bitcoin fully, um, I think it it you can you get this aha moment and you start to understand it when you use it. And so, hopefully, a, a gold bugs can do what they normally do and then say, oh, you know what? It's also got this function where I can spend some of this as Bitcoin. Let's give it a go. Uh, and mm, because no, because nobody's really accepting gold as payment. Exactly. But there's a lot of people that accept Bitcoin as payment. And so you're taking your, not only are you helping provide liquidity for gold and Bitcoin, but you're using the payment rail that Bitcoin comes with and allowing 
gold bugs to utilize that payment rail with a new type of currency, but while keeping their reserves in gold, it's kind of like, um, you know, the gold-backed debit cards and stuff that you see popping up where people are trying to, again, add liquidity and ease the inconvenience of trying to spend gold, but still allow a very convenient and comfortable way for their clients to store gold and keep preserving their wealth angle. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, I, as we move forward in this cryptocurrency world, I really see gold, the Bitcoin has really given gold uh, usefulness again. I mean, I, I would never say it was not useful. It was always useful as a store of value, but it was very, it was very tough to get it out. You know, you, you would, you would take two days to complete a wire transfer and and then the gold would be there in the vault, uh, secured in your name as your property, uh, as in a bailment contract, it's called, which means it's held by someone else for you, uh, like like you store a couch in a in a storage facility. It's your couch sitting in a secure storage facility. This was something that only the rich really did, and and it was very liquid. It took days for you to get that money back out, and you had to get um, a fair chunk of it out. Whereas with Bitcoin, I can. People can sell down to 10 cents worth or, or less, actually, uh, a milligram worth of gold and spend tiny amounts. So how I see gold now is that gold will be a store of value, a good solid store of value. I mean, it's held its value for 3000 years. There's not one currency in the world that has accomplished the same. The longest running currency is around about it's not even 200 years old. Um, and then it, the, every other ones get inflated to hell or they, they die in some spectacular manner. And when they die, it causes a massive amount of pain for people because they, you know, older people that have been saving this stuff um, go through a lot of suffering. Uh, they don't have enough money to, uh, or energy to re-earn their life savings uh, and all the rest of it. Anyway, uh, so gold is this great store of value. Uh, prove them over time and Bitcoin is very young and no one's really sure of its value yet it's still in this price discovery phase that's why you have such massive volatility because it doesn't know the market doesn't know what is this thing worth is it worth a million dollars a coin is it worth 10 cents you know people can make guesses all day long but the market will really find out and that will take time and as we get more and more competitive like ether in the marketplace People will be scared of having everything in Bitcoin. What I always say is try to hold some form of gold in that portfolio. With that, you can jump into Ether, you can jump into Bitcoin, you can jump back and forth. But you know that if you want to sleep at night, um, you can put it in something a bit more stable. Yeah, I love the combination of gold and Bitcoin because... Up to this point, if you store gold, well, th that's great. You can store gold and you can preserve your wealth in gold in a vault, but you couldn't spend it. You couldn't do anything with it. It's just kind of assets sitting around where you. it's very difficult to sell it or to transfer it or you have to do, there's large margins on it or it, it just wasn't convenient. Mm -hmm. And so what you guys at Voltoro are doing, you saw that in the marketplace. You saw that, okay, gold's great. Gold, gold has a lot of purpose. But Bitcoin has a lot of purpose, too, and some of those purposes are similar, and then some of those purposes are different. The main difference is that now with Bitcoin, we also have a payment rail or a way to send Bitcoin, whereas right. gold doesn't have that. Gold still remains in the physical world where it stores wealth. People know how to protect their physical goods, so people feel comfortable protecting that. Whereas with Bitcoin, it's different. But now the combination of the two, the combination of the physical gold to secure your wealth and the digital Bitcoin so that you can transfer that wealth whenever you want is uh, you know, very, very complementary. It, it almost prevents us now from needing to use the U.S. dollar because we have a store of value, which the dollar tries to be. Well, at least they say they try to be. You know, it, we've got the store of value, which is gold. And then we have the payment mechanism, the payment rail, which is very fast, very cheap, very strong and secure and encrypted in Bitcoin. And it really gives us a, a well-rounded money. Absolutely. Um, I, you know, the thing is that the whole financial system is on such shaky ground. And, uh, you know, when most people don't know, uh, I mentioned it before, but when you put money in a bank, 
it's not your money anymore. It's they they go off, take that money and they speculate on it and they do things with it and buy derivatives and all, all the rest of it. And you don't you, all you have is a promise. And in fact, Deutsche Bank um, just recently started using language uh, in their uh, in their uh, terms of use, which was quite interesting. Um, there was a, a story on Zero Hedge about this. Um, and if, for some, I can read a part of it here. In, in the new terms of use, it's like, in case of bankruptcy or risk of bankruptcy of, financial, of the financial institution, the saver is at risk of losing their savings or may be subject to a reduction, conversion into shares, bail-in, uh, of the amount of the claim that he or she uh, has in the financial institution. Um, so there we have already a, a, a solid statement saying, we are playing around with your money uh, in a bank. And that's the good thing about gold is when you buy gold, it's it's off of Voltoro's books. It's not, it's not sitting there on our books. Even if we go bankrupt uh, because we're, we're, you know, buying Italian furniture for the office or whatever, it is, um, the people's gold is their gold in their vault. And even liquidators can't touch it because it's not our property. It's customer property. And that's so different from a bank that that you just, it's once you put money in there, it's theirs. They do what they want and you just have to wish that they're doing good things with it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And most of the time they're not, they're you're not even incentivized to doing good things because they know they're going to get bailed out. I think that's a huge pain in society that, that much of the uh, first world or, or Europe and uh, the Americas, for instance, they don't necessarily realize that banks can do this. You know, we saw it in Cyprus. A- ask, ask the people living in Cyprus what it was like to have, you know, their money taken from them whenever their banks collapsed. Yeah. And this is something that I appreciate what you guys are doing because you're storing allocated gold for people as a means to help preserve wealth, get some of your wealth outside of the banking system. And if you need this wealth quickly, we don't have to deliver the gold to mm-hmm. you. We can deliver Bitcoin to you very quickly. Absolutely. It's a, it's, it's a wonderful service that you guys are offering. Josh. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's switch gears here just for a second. Yep. How has been an on being an entrepreneur provided more freedom or flexibility in your life? A lot of people say they want to be their own boss because it allow them to take the day off and whatever. But the actual truth is the when you first start a startup, you're creating a baby and it's your baby and you're you're going to be looking after that day in day out. So it's it's not an easy task, but usually you start a business because you love doing something. You love something. And when you love doing something, you don't work a day in your life. When I um, started this project, I wanted to start something that I was super passionate about, and that that was Bitcoin and gold, and uh, and allowing, uh, emancipating the the developing world. Um, I still did a lot of work in in the Philippines with underprivileged women, and and seeing some of these these uh, the, the people living in the developing world who have been really crushed for many many years uh, in in the whole African continent. Uh, a lot of countries there have been uh, suppressed through these economic hitmen that having these controlled monies um, and central banks uh, and being able to disrupt that was just like this big calling. So that's that's what's really changed in my life is that starting this has been an opportunity for me to tap into something that I love doing and to be the mischief I want to see in the world and the <laughs> not just the change. Yeah, and it's providing other people options. I think that's the main thing. It's You're helping provide monetary options, money options. Yeah. And we don't even know necessarily how that's going to provide freedom for like your clients or, or just gold and Bitcoin people in general. But you know, it, if we do see some type of crisis coming in the dollar, for instance, or in the euro or in the pound or any of the major currencies, the freedom is going to be realized then by the people that had the foresight to protect some of their wealth using services just like Volta. Yeah, and we saw that during the Greek crisis. We saw just before they closed the banks, we saw a peak in um, uh, a little mini peak. It was very small because, uh, you know, we just launched, but... 
from people living in Greek, so Greek IP addresses, converting some of their savings to gold. And then when the when the banks shut their doors, they couldn't get Bitcoin. They couldn't get gold. And in fact, now I've, uh, my brother is married to a Greek woman and she was saying it's it's impossible to get money out. In fact, people using drug techniques to smuggle cash out of the country because they're not allowed to wire more than 300 euros a month and they're not allowed to use credit cards. They're, it's real lockdown mode. It's psycho. Yeah, the, the freedom's really going to come whenever that happens again to a large country, maybe the UK or Germany or the US, and people are having these currency control issues. But if they had gold stored in the Voltoro vault, they could sell their gold, send out Bitcoin with that Bitcoin, buy an Amazon gift card and just continue as life as normal. It really opens up you know, a lot of opportunity for people to retain control over their finances, which, you know, if you don't have control over your life, how can you possibly be free? And money is a big part of that freedom and that control. Yeah, yeah, Josh, absolutely um, agree with that. Let's wrap up here pretty soon, Josh. Is there any type of of advice that you would give for young entrepreneurs who are starting this journey or, or not even necessarily young entrepreneurs, but just anybody that is listening to this podcast and is starting to understand that the entrepreneurial process is a good way to build freedom in their life. I would say the easiest part of starting a project is coming up with the idea and not to be afraid of people stealing the idea because that holds a lot of people back they don't want to tell anyone the idea they want to keep it under wraps they want to and to be honest anyone that started startups before knows that you can't just even if you it's the best idea you're not going to drop everything and steal someone's idea you're going to um because it's that's the hard work and on top of that because it's e it's fairly easy to have ideas. People have ideas all the time where it's like, oh, that's a pain point. Imagine if da da da, right? But take time to think about that idea before starting a startup. Because once you start uh, uh, being an entrepreneur, it could take you know two or three years of your life. So focus on that idea and think it through. Think through. Imagine doing this for three years. Am I going to still be happy? Is this going to change? Uh, is this going to bring me happiness? Because that's really in life. If you're happy, you will do everything p beautifully. If you because if you enjoy what you're doing, you're going to do it really well. You're going to do it better than anyone else, and that means you're going to get paid for it. Because when you do something good, you get paid for it. Uh, generally, you know, most of the time. And so, really focus on the idea first, and 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 write them down. Don't jump straight into it. Think about the ideas. Have other ideas, and then look through your book of ideas and go. Well, you know what? This one here is the one I want to focus on. Yeah, I like the uh, the the quote about how everyone has a million dollar idea, but it's only worth about a dollar until you start to action it and bring it into reality. Yeah. Everybody sits around, has wonderful ideas. And for those entrepreneurs out there which are afraid to talk about their million dollar idea, well, most likely the people that you're gonna talk about it to or with, they've got their own ideas and they're not just gonna drop what they're doing and start implementing what you're doing. They're not gonna action what you're doing or start executing on it. Most people don't execute on, on a lot of business ideas because there's only so much time you can only have, you know, really one or maybe two project projects at a time. But the idea isn't worth that much. It's the action behind the idea that's worth it. And it ties it back into Liberty Entrepreneurs, the idea of a free society, like the, the libertarians, you know, they have more theories and more ideas about how a free society could and should work than anyone I know. But it's not until you you start acting and executing on those ideas that you actually build that freedom in your own life. That's why I like the term actionable freedom, you know, or build freedom. Well, Josh, I really appreciate you coming on the show. Is there anything you'd like to wrap up with? Anything that we didn't get to? Um, I would say, you know, folks, if, if you haven't looked into, into cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin, if, if you haven't um, uh, played around with it, you know, do yourself a favor, take, take that uh, an hour out of your time and, and look at some videos on YouTube that explain Bitcoin. Uh, uh, look at it and, and understand it because it is, uh, it is an amazing invention 
Uh, it has its downfalls, but that's where combining the old and the new together, you know, Bitcoin and gold, we, we're getting very, very close to, I feel, the perfect money and uh, uh, having money that's spent into existence and not lent into existence with debt. And so, um, yeah, uh, if anyone wants to stay in touch with me, uh, my email is uh, joshua at voltoro.com. Uh, we're currently seeking a seed round of funding. So if anyone's out there that, that's an angel investor or a seed round investor, um, get in touch with us. Josh Shigala, thank you so much for joining me today. You're definitely a Liberty Entrepreneur. I really appreciate what you're doing. I'll include all of your contact information and links to Voltoro in the show notes. And yeah, just thank you. Keep continue on. Oh, and thank you very much. Continue what you're doing. What you're doing is, is super important. I love it. Spreading liberty through action and through entrepreneurship is, I think, the, the fastest way to true, true liberty. I could not agree more. Thank you so much, Josh. Thanks, man. Cheers, mate. Thanks again for listening to episode 35, How Bitcoin Enhances Gold with Josh Chigala. If you have a chance, remember iTunes ratings are extremely helpful. And if you could do us a favor and leave an honest review, it'd be greatly appreciated. I'll leave the iTunes link in the show notes. And thank you so much. Until next time, keep building freedom.